the Inquisition had already happened, that there was absolutely corporate greed and that the, there is price fixing in our grocery market here in Canada. Um, I asked the question to some members of this House whether or not maybe the fact that Canadians were buying more groceries uh, from the grocery market as opposed to restaurants, maybe because of the high amount of pharmaceuticals that were being bought during the pandemic or the fact that some retailers such as Sobeys, Loblaws and others uh, were actually helping administer vaccines, that that could help account for some of the corporate profit and higher prices that we've seen. Does the member opposite think, or just the member opposite, my honourable colleague, uh, think that this particular question might be a little bit more nuanced than the NDP is putting in the motion today? The honourable member for Vaughan Woodbridge. I, I thank the honourable member from King's Hat, and my colleague, not the member opposite, of course, uh, the, the, uh, for, for the question. What I would say this uh, during COVID 19, uh, all the restaurant, like your restaurants were closed, Canadians shifted their spending habits. And I think the real factor when we look at uh, how corporations are doing, and in the days that I worked in the 20 plus years, is look at their, their what they call their EBITDA margins, their operating profit margins, cash flow metrics, to actually see, you know, if it's just a bump in, a large bump in revenues from Canadians shifting their, their spending habits, translating into, yes, higher profits, but actually their margins staying the same. Uh, obviously, like I said in my, in my remarks, uh, the changes to the Competition Act through the competition, with the Competition Bureau are very, very important. Crony capitalism has no place in, in, in my world, has no place in our society, is detrimental to consumers, and we always need to tackle that, and we need to have better enforcement measures for the Competition Bureau. Thank you, Madam the President. You mean debate uh, the Honourable Member for Hamilton Mountain. <clears throat> Thank you, Speaker. I am pleased to have the opportunity to address this topic. The inflation we are experiencing is a global phenomenon, and unfortunately, Canada is not immune. My riding of Hamilton Mountain is not immune. We know Canadians are feeling the rising cost of living, particularly through higher grocery bills, rent, and gas prices. While this motion calls for many measures that the government has already done or is actively doing, we do welcome the opportunity to highlight our work uh, to support Canadians and describe how we will continue to do so. The government is helping families weather this global challenge through our affordability plan. A suite of targeted measures totaling $12.1 billion in new support this year to help make life more affordable for millions of Canadians. This plan is putting more money in the pockets of Canadians who need it the most, when they need it the most, without adding fuel to the fire of inflation. Speaker, the government's affordability plan is particularly targeted to help address the needs of low-income Canadians who are most exposed to inflation because of investments our government has already made in the last two federal budgets. Many of the measures in our affordability plan are in place right now to help Canadians. In Budget 2021, our government enhanced the Canada Workers' Benefit, putting as much as $2,400 more into the pockets of low-income families starting this year. Many recipients have already received this increase for support through their 2021 tax return. This enhancement of the Canada Workers' Benefit is extending support to about 1 million more Canadians and helping lift nearly 100,000 people out of poverty. We also implemented a 10% increase to old age security for seniors over 75. That began in July this year. This is the first permanent increase to the OAS pension since 1973, other than adjustments due to inflation. It will strengthen the financial security of 3.3 million seniors, providing more than $800 in the first year to full pensioners automatically. In addition, our government continues to work with provinces and territories to build a Canada-wide early learning and childcare system. Thanks to an historic investment of up to $27 billion over five years, regulated childcare fees will be cut by an average of 50% by the end of this year. We also increased the federal minimum wage to $15 an hour and indexed it to inflation, making it now $15.55 an hour. Furthermore, the key benefits that Canadians rely on, including the Canada Child Benefit, the GST credit, the Canada Pension Plan, Old Age Security, the Guaranteed Income Supplement, already indexed to inflation. These measures are providing real and much needed su to support to Canadians right now, although of course we know there's always more to do. 
Speaker, through our new legislation, our government has tabled Bill C-30 and Bill C-31. We are proposing to provide $3.1 billion in additional support in 2022 on top of the funds previously allocated in Budget 2022 to help make life more affordable for millions of Canadians. This includes doubling the GST credit for six months, which would provide $2.5 billion in additional targeted support this year to the roughly 11 million Canadians who already received the tax credit. Single Canadians without children would receive up to an extra $234, and couples with two children would receive up to an extra $467 in their pockets this year. Seniors would receive an extra $225 on average. Providing a payment of $500 this year to 1.8 million low-income renters who are struggling with the cost of housing through a one-time top-up to the Canada Housing Benefit. This more than doubles our Budget 2022 commitment, reaching twice as many Canadians as initially promised and will be in addition to the Canada Housing Benefit currently co-funded and delivered by provinces and territories. And Third, providing dental care for Canadians without dental insurance, earning less than $90,000, starting with hundreds of thousands of children under 12 this year. Direct payments totaling up to $1,300 per child over the next two years for dental care services. This is only the first step outlined in the Supply and Confidence Agreement to develop a national dental care program. Taken together, here's what the affordability plan looks like for Canadians that we represent. A couple in Thunder Bay with an income of $45,000 and a child in daycare could receive $7,800 above their existing benefits in this fiscal year. A single recent graduate in Edmonton with an entry-level job and an income of $24,000 could receive an additional $1,300 in new and enhanced benefits. A senior with a disability in Trois-Rivières could benefit from over $2,700 more this year than she received last year. Simply put, our plan is putting more money in the pockets of Canadians who need it the most, at a time when they need it the most. Our lowest paid workers, our low income renters, families who can't afford to have their kids see a dentist. Speaker, our government is fully aware that Canadians are feeling the effects of elevated inflation, particularly when they reach for items at the grocery store or at the gas pump. Canadians can be confident that they have access to support when they need it the most. Since 2015, the government has delivered real improvements to make Canadians' lives more affordable, including introducing the Canada Child Benefit, which has helped lift hundreds of thousands of children out of poverty since 2015, providing 10 days of paid sick leave for all federally regulated private sector employees, and making post-secondary education more affordable by waiving interest on Canada student loans until March of 2023 and ensuring no one making less than $40,000 will need to make payments. Our affordability plan builds on these successes and is providing more money to the most vulnerable Canadians this year to help make life more affordable. A tax system in which everyone pays their fair share requires actions on multiple fronts. Addressing ad aggressive tax planning schemes, aligning our rules with evolving international norms, ensuring that digital service providers pay their fair share of taxes, and strengthening the government's ability to crack down on tax evasion. We are committed to continuing to build an economy that works for all Canadians and leaves no one behind. Thank you, Speaker. That's, uh, that's all the time we have for now. The Honourable Member for Hamilton Mountain will have another uh, three minutes, or sorry, two minutes and 45 seconds coming to her if she wants to wrap up after uh, uh, when we come back. Now we'll proceed to statements by members. Déclaration de député. The Honourable Member for Bonavista, Buren Trinity. Mr. Speaker, on the eve of Canada's Fire Prevention Week, I want to recognize the tireless work of all the firefighters in my riding of Bonavista Beer and Trinity, the majority of which are volunteers who assist and serve their communities every day as they respond to fires, medical emergencies, and other traumatic events. 
In reform, many towns across Bonne Vista, Beer, and Trinity recognize the service and sacrifices of these firefighters at award banquets and receptions that bring together volunteers, their families, and community members. Many volunteers are recognized for significant milestones of 5, 10, and 30 years service. I'm so grateful to be invited to many of these banquets every year. I always try to get to as many as I can because I value and respect the great work of these tireless volunteers. Mr. Speaker, I want to acknowledge all firefighters in Bonavista, Beer, and Trinity, and across Newfoundland and Labrador, across the country, and thank them all for their bravery and hard work on behalf of the residents that they serve. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Desna Day, Mississippi Churchill River. Oh. Mr. Speaker, Northern Saskatchewan is home to the most compassionate people in Canada. In Meadow Lake, Evie Donokowicz and her family donated land to build the Northwest Community Lodge, a 72-bed long-term care home. Mrs. Donokowicz's additional $100,000 contribution to the lodge's fundraising campaign helps ensure that this new home will create an environment that delivers quality care and comfort for seniors in Meadow Lake for decades. In La Ronge, the generosity is from La Ronge Petroleum, who along with residents Dennis and Linda Renault, have raised more than $100,000 for the Jim Pattison Children's Hospital in Saskatoon. They wrapped a semi-trailer with the Children's Hospital logo as a visual reminder of the work the Foundation is doing. Donors' logos are then added to the side of the trailer as it travels all around Saskatchewan. Mr. Speaker, these selfless acts of generosity speak to the heart of Northern Saskatchewan, where hardworking and supportive people make our communities always feel like home. Bravo. Honourable Member for London West. Mr. Speaker, I rise to mark World Cerebral Policy Day. Cerebral Palsy is a permanent disability that affects movement and posture. Its impact can range from weakness in one hand to almost a complete lack of voluntary movement. There are over 17 million people in the world living with cerebral palsy and approximately 80,000 of them live in Canada. As we celebrate this day and support everyone uh, living with cerebral palsy, I want to highlight the tremendous work done by families, loved ones, and caregivers in making sure that people with cerebral palsy are supported in their daily lives and their wellness remains at the forefront. I would like to end my statement by emphasizing the continuous need to create a more accessible and inclusive future for everyone here in Canada, especially with, for people living with disabilities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. L'honorable député de Berthier Masquinonger. The Honourable Member for Berthier Masquinonger. Mr. Speaker, finally, we have back this year the 43rd festival of the buckwheat pancake from Louisville. Mauricie and all of Quebec can be proud of this festival. Initially, this buckwheat meal was used by the poorest people along with some other meals or other dishes that were very thrifty meals, and who would have thought that something so simple could become such a rich tra tradition? Thanks to President André Auger and his team, we have a remarkable event which brings people together from all of Quebec and elsewhere. And so I would invite everyone to take advantage of the programming. There are shows by local artists, Super Bingo. There's an auction and a par historic parade. Come see us, come, come meet our Miller and discover our region and its history. Long live the country of buckwheat. Do I take it? Okay. The Honourable Member for Moose Jaw, Lake Centre, Lanigan. Mr. Speaker, the local rink is the heart of every Canadian community. It's where our kids learn to skate or curl learn important skills and li life lessons like teamwork and sportsmanship. Perhaps most importantly, create lifelong friendships and cherish memories. After a fire burned down the rink in Pence 30 years ago, people rallied and built its replacement in just 15 months. Recently, the arena needed upgrades. People may remember that Pence was up for Craft Hockeyville contest, here, here. but they did not win. That did not stop them. This small town was able to raise more than $500,000. Wow. This past weekend, I was honoured to attend the grand reopening. Mr. Speaker, this is exactly the kind of story that makes me proud to represent Pence 
and other communities across rural Saskatchewan. Here, here. Thank you. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Pickering Uxbridge. Mr. Speaker, this morning we learned that the leader of the official opposition and the Conservative Party have been using tags for to promote and to connect and target with incel right-wing anti-women violent rhetoric for their own Shameful. personal and political Shameful. gain. Shameful. These incels, Mr. Speaker, promote the murder of single women and men who date them. They want to decriminalize marital rape, Mr. Speaker. They have very real-life consequences, including followers like the Toronto van attacker. Mr. Speaker, nobody believes that the leader of the opposition didn't know. This has been going on for more than four and a half years. Mr. Speaker, will the leader of the official opposition and the women in his caucus stand up against this hate, apologize, denounce it, and who in this House is going to stand with us? And in the Honourable Member for L'Honorable Député de Sherbrooke. The Honourable Member for Sherbrooke. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This week is Mental Illness Awareness Week. Over the last two years, Canadians have suffered, inequality has increased, and existing health gaps have deepened, both in Sherbrooke and elsewhere. But the pandemic has also facilitated, facilitated conversations, open and authentic conversations on mental health and substance use issues. We must all continue those conversations and ensure that anyone with a mental illness receives the support they need. More and more throughout Canada, the idea of mental health is part of our institutions. That's what we are seeing at the University of Sherbrooke. I'd like to thank Professor Guillaume Rousseau and his, t and his class who are visiting us today in Ottawa. Over the last few years, the University of Sherbrooke has launched a number of initiatives to support students and offer a wide range of services, supported by the RBC University Expertise Centre for Mental Health. Together, we will continue to end taboos and we will continue to increase our knowledge about mental health issues. The Honourable Member for Vaughan Woodbridge. Mr. Speaker, in 1847, the first running of the Woodbridge Fall Fair was organized by John Gamble, the first mayor of Vaughan Township and a parliamentary spokesperson for Ontario farmers, millers and merchants who believe that the agriculture sector and its workers are at the heart of a community's success. True to these values, for 175 years, the fair has been a place to come together and celebrate the joy of autumn, community agriculture and our local history. Thanks to the tireless efforts of the Woodbridge Agricultural Society's volunteers, this year's fair promises to be the most entertaining one yet. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I would like to invite my colleagues to join me in congratulating the Woodbridge Fall Fair and everyone celebrating this community mainstay on its 175th anniversary. This Thanksgiving weekend, Mr. Speaker, come visit the fair with us. I will be there, and I look forward to seeing many of the residents of the City of Vaughan and beyond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Niagara West. The last two years have been difficult for Canadians. This is especially true for Canadians who made a personal medical decision that the Prime Minister disapproved of. Because they disagreed with him on this issue, the Prime Minister called them extremists, racist, misogynist. He also questioned whether they should be tolerated. If you didn't agree with him on your personal health choices, the Prime Minister said you hold unacceptable views. That's why he supported the firing of these folks. At the same time, he took away their unemployment insurance benefits. Then he banned them from travelling on planes and trains. This happened here in Canada. If that wasn't enough, he introduced a discriminatory border surveillance scheme that ended up being a logistical nightmare, the Arrive Can app, the app that also ended up destroying many businesses in the travel and tourism industry, including in my region of Niagara. I believe the Prime Minister's comments and his actions will echo in history and will be judged very poorly by future generations. I believe he should be held accountable for those actions. Yeah. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I would like to say to the Prime Minister, enough is enough. Let folks live their lives. Yeah. The Honourable Member for Charlottetown. Speaker, I rise 
Fifth Day of Recognition of World Spine Day, which is taking place this year on October 16th. The purpose of World Spine Day is to raise awareness around back health and spinal disorders. Musculoskeletal conditions like low back pain are a leading cause of disability, impacting 11 million Canadians a year. These conditions are more prevalent than cancer, stroke, heart disease, diabetes, and Alzheimer's combined. One in eight Canadians suffer from chronic low back pain, and it is responsible for almost one third of lost time at work. This is an important issue that impacts the health and economic well-being of our communities, large and small. This year's theme is Every Spine Counts, which emphasizes the diversity of underserved communities impacted and the need for improving access to regulated essential spinal health services like chiropractors. Today and on World Spine Day, I call on all members to recognize the importance of spinal disorders and spinal health in our communities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Edmonton, Mill Woods. Mr. Speaker, I rise to mark National Catholic Health Care Week and celebrate the impact of Catholic health care in our communities. This year's themes, Building Bridges undermines, underlines the importance of creating connections, addressing gaps, and working together to improve health and well-being of all Canadians. In my riding of Edmonton Mill Woods, the Grey Nuns Hospital, Community Hospital provides a full range of health care services. In 1988, during the transfer of acute services, staff walked from the Edmonton General to the Grey Nuns, carrying a torch as a symbol of continuing the sisters' legacy of compassionate care at the new facility. The sisters were instrumental in establishing palliative care services, mental health programs, and care for pregnant mothers and babies. In fact, my daughter was born at the Grey Nuns. During this week, the Covenant family will share many stories that show their impact and mission in action. I hope that we can all find opportunities to build bridges, create connections, and improve the well-being of all those around us. Yeah, yeah. The Honourable Member for Elgin, Middlesex, London. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We're in a crisis that we must address. For the past several months, I have had the opportunity to sit on the Heritage Committee where we're focusing on Hockey Canada and the rape that occurred following their gala dinner in 2018. But, Mr. Speaker, this has opened up a whole new can of worms. In the coming weeks, Rick Westhead, the reporter that brought us the story on Hockey Canada, will be releasing his documentary where viewers will be hearing from former gymnasts who have come forward and shared their stories of inappropriate touching and sexual abuse. Mr. Speaker, over 400 gymnasts have come now forward asking for an independent investigation. We are hearing from high-performance gymnasts, boxers and rowers who are all sharing their stories. The common denominator here, Mr. Speaker, these are our kids. These athletes are our children. Someone said to me, Hockey Canada is too big. We have no power against them. Well, Mr. Speaker, I disagree. No one is too big when it comes to the safety and well-being of our children. There needs to be an investigation, and this government needs to take action on behalf of the many young athletes who have been wrongfully violated. Thank you, Mr. Here, here. Speaker. <laughs> The Honourable Member for Oshlaga. Mr. Speaker, we heard very shocking news this morning. The leader of the Conservative Party used incel references, a movement that promotes degrading, disgusting behaviour towards women. This is not worthy of the leader of the opposition. After several years, we cannot say that this is an error, but instead a deliberate strategy. He must apologize, because these groups have a real impact on the lives, the real lives of women in this country. Not only should he apologize publicly, but women in his party should also rise to criticize him. There should not be a political border to the rights of women. The Honourable Member for Vancouver, Kingsway. Mr. Speaker, October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, a month dedicated to honouring those facing breast cancer and those who have lost their lives. We also pay tribute to all health professionals and caregivers providing treatment and support. Mr. Speaker, one in eight Canadian women will be diagnosed with breast cancer. 
This year alone, 27,000 will learn they have breast cancer, and we will lose 5,500 people. Mothers, sisters, wives, daughters, aunts, cousins, co-workers and friends. So today we call on the federal government to commit to saving lives and reducing suffering related to this terrible disease. We should start by suspending the use of flawed breast screening guidelines from the Canadian Task Force on Preventive Healthcare and catch up to other countries who do better. It's time to appoint a credible panel of qualified specialists and informed patients to develop breast screening guidelines using current, accurate and relevant evidence. If we do, we can help put an end to avoidable deaths of Canadian women. Mr. Speaker, it's time. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, last week I participated in the festivities for the fifth anniversary of the business Gravité, which was founded five years ago by Julie Voyer and her partners. The business bought five weeklies in the Montérégie region, including our local writing newspaper, Le Reflet. These weeklies are indispensable as a source of information and a platform for towns, businesses, organizations, elected officials, and for individuals. Gravité Media is supporting local media and also has a marketing branch, which is doing very well in my area. And many organizations, businesses, and towns have benefited from their expertise. I'd like to underscore the exceptional work on the, Gravi on the Gravité team. Not only do they work hard, but they are also getting involved in our local organizations. I'd like to thank Madame Voyer and the entire incredible team. The Honourable Member for Essex. Mr. Speaker, the new Conservative leader will put the people first. Yeah. Their paychecks, their savings, their home and their country. The carbon tax is an utter failure. Liberals say it will reduce emissions, but emissions have gone up under this government. BC has had a carbon tax for 14 years, and their emissions have only gone up. Quebec has had one for 12 years, and their emissions have gone up as well. The carbon tax only drives the cost of everything higher and is punishing on Canadians who can least afford it. The Liberals say when you get more money back from the carbon tax, but the PBO has said this is false and many Canadians lose money because of the carbon tax. Yet this Liberal government is going to triple the carbon tax by April 2023. It would seem the Prime Minister is experiencing the carbon tax differently than hard-working Canadians. But help is on the way, Mr. Speaker. A Conservative government led by our new leader will scrap the carbon tax. Yeah. The Honourable Member for Fredericton. Mr. Speaker, one of the many reasons that make Fredericton such a vibrant community is the dynamism of the people, the leaders, the dreamers, the doers. Today I'm so proud to celebrate the achievements of a few of them that I have the honour to represent here in this house. Keith Lyon, the recipient of the Champion of Mental Health Award for sharing his journey with schizophrenia and donating proceeds from his four children's books to the psych psychiatric unit that helped him. Natasha Deuge, founder of Kinova Bioworks, was named as a semi-finalist for the Caney Award for Entrepreneur of the Year for creating a natural alternative to artificial food preservatives. Earlier this month, the four-person team representing the Fredericton Fire Department won the Canadian FireFit Championships, running, climbing stairs, hoisting hoses, saving lives. The competition is done in full gear to simulate actual field conditions. Willie Gisgat to Candy Paul of Under One Sky Friendship Centre, who won the Prime Minister's Award for Excellence in Early Childhood Education, along with Angela Dontremont and Shauna Kelly from Park Street Elementary School for their award in excellence in teaching. I invite everyone to join me in congratulating these incredible Fredericktonians on their achievements. Go Thank you. Question oral, oral questions. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, first I'd like to wish the family of the Prime Minister a happy Thanksgiving, but it won't be too joyful for many families because of the fact that the cost of turkey has risen by 16 percent. Other food have also increased by 20 percent. So 20 percent of Canadians will have to reduce their Thanksgiving dinner. So how much will the cost of Thanksgiving dinner increase when the Prime Minister triples the carbon tax, the Right Honourable Prime Minister? Mr. Speaker, we all have heard stories of Canadians who are facing 
rising costs of living, and that's why this government decided to take action. We are sending hundreds of dollars to families with GST tax credit, and we're also moving forward with help for renters who are low income and help for families who are low income so that they can pay for dental care for their children. Unfortunately, even if the Conservative leader supports our uh, GST measure in the end to credit GTS, but he's not agreeing to help for dental care. When is he going to help Canadians with dental care? The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Wish the Prime Minister and his family a happy Thanksgiving. Uh, however, it won't be too happy for a lot of people whose costs have gone out of control. In fact, the cost of turkey is up 16 percent. According to a one food per professor, cost of other items are up over 20 percent, and one fifth of Canadians will have to reduce what they put on the plate this Thanksgiving weekend. How much will the Prime Minister's tripling of the tax on our farmers, truckers, and consumers increase the cost of Thanksgiving dinner for the future? The right honourable Prime Minister. We know Canadians across the country are struggling with the global inflation crisis, and that's why we're moving forward with concrete measures to help out. After we propose the GST rebate that's going to uh, help significant numbers of families across this country, uh, the Leader of the Opposition came out criticizing it, but then fortunately reversed himself and is now supporting our GST credit. Will he now support uh, the low-income uh, dental supports for families? Will he support the rental supports we're giving? Kids uh, deserve to have happy smiles, why uh, won't the uh, Leader of the Opposition help them with that? Yes. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Well, they won't be smiling if their parents can't afford a little bit of pumpkin pie for them at Thanksgiving dinner. Look at the cost increases that have happened. 16 per cent increase for the cost of turkey, 22 per cent increase for potatoes, bread up 13 per cent, butter 13 per cent, cranberries 12 per cent, bacon. 10 per cent. That all adds up to an unaffordable Thanksgiving dinner. The Prime Minister wants to make it worse still by tripling, tripling, tripling his tax on our farmers, our truckers, and ultimately our consumers. How much will that add to the cost of Thanksgiving? The right honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, he wants to help Canadians, but he will not stand with low-income Canadians who want to give their kids better smiles. Uh, but there is another important issue that on Canadian, is on Canadians' minds, particularly Canadians' women's minds, as we meet here. If it were not for global news, we would not have learned that the Conservative leader has been purposefully using his videos to appeal to far-right, misogynistic online movements. These are anti-women movements, and they have had devastating real-life consequences. Mr. Speaker, I call on the Conservative leader to stand in this House, take responsibility and apologize. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. I condemned this organization and I corrected the problem as soon as I, it became known to me, Mr. Speaker. But I condemn, I condemn all forms of misogyny, including when the Prime Minister fired the very first female uh, Indigenous Attorney General. who had to leave politics, and I condemn him for when he dressed up in racist costumes so many times he forgot them all. We condemn it always, Mr. Speaker. The right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the choice made by the Conservative leader in reaching out to extremist online groups into uh, you know, pulling in anti-women, misogynistic groups for his own political gain is one that he will have to answer for. I think women across this country want to know uh, why he allowed this to happen and want to see him take responsibility for it. The uh, Honourable Leader of the Opposition. 
I took responsibility and corrected it as soon as it became known to me. But the Prime Minister does not take responsibility for the extremism that he has funded. He funded a vicious anti-Semite to spread hatred online with tax taxpayers' dollars. He repeatedly, in fact, so many times he can't even keep track, dressed up in racist costumes for which he has not ever come fully to account. And he drove many women of his own caucus out of the party and out of Parliament altogether with his mistreatment of them. We condemn all of that behaviour. We condemn misogyny always and everywhere. And we ask the Prime Minister to finally do the same. Speaker, we have all seen the effective campaign that uh, the leader of the opposition ran to become leader, using online videos, uh, using uh, ways of reaching out through social media. We all marveled at his admiration of old wood. What we didn't see was that every time he put out the... Are we done? Prime Minister, from the top, please. Mr. Speaker, a lot of ink was spilled and a lot of admiration for the effectiveness of uh, the Leader of the Opposition's campaign to become leader, using social media, losing, using clever videos. We all marveled at his admiration for old wood. But what we didn't see, Mr. Speaker, was uh, his uh, choice to include deliberate reach out, reaches out to far-right organizations, including hateful anti-women organizations, to try and advance his own political gains. He has played too close to the line with extremists for too long. Now he's got caught. Will he admit it? Will he apologize? Will he take responsibility? The Honourable Member for Belleuil Chambly. Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member. I'd like to know what the Prime Minister's intentions are at Roxham Road. Increasing the number of immigrants without the approval of Quebec, favor, giving favour to contracts to Liberal members, and given the labour shortage, while we are entering workers who are vulnerable, who do not speak French, and who we won't give a work permit to for over a year. Do we understand that there's nothing, nothing at all humanitarian about the, the Prime Minister's policy at Roxham Road? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, we all know that immigration is essential to our economy. Like the member knows already, Quebec establishes its own immigration targets. Last year, we welcomed more than 50,000 new permanent residents in Quebec, and therefore we're always going to work closely with Quebec's government to welcome immigrants, to ensure economic growth, and to ensure that the wealth of French language and Quebec culture continues. The Honourable Member for Ballet Chambly, I will continue to denounce the policies that favour cheap labour. And rather than spending a half a billion dollars to hire immigration civil servants, we're putting them into infrastructure and contracts, an amount to Liberal Party donators. Can the Prime Minister order the immediate tabling of unredacted contracts for Roxham Road since 2017? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, the Bloc continues to claim for more power for Quebec in immigration, but the reality is that Quebec already has enormous power with respect to immigration. Any other country, uh, province. The reality, Mr. Speaker, is that they could welcome many more immigrants than they're already doing, and they could ensure that they all speak French. They have all sorts of powers, and we are here to work with them to continue to enrich the Quebec nation and Canada as a whole with immigration and through the defense of French and with economic growth through everyone. The Honourable Member for Rosemont-Lapetite-Patrie. Mr. Speaker, 
With prices rising, people are feeling the squeeze and are struggling to make ends meet. And big bosses are taking advantage of human misery to line their pockets. And that disgusts me. The CEO of Sobeys makes $8 million. Metro CEO, $5 million. Loblaw CEO, $5 million as well. Profits up 17 and 7 27 percent. People have to cut back on their food, and the Liberals let the big companies get rich on the backs of everyone. Well, the Liberals act to stop the greedflation of the big grocery chains? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I agree that it's unacceptable to have families to have to pay more than ever for groceries, while grocery chains are raking in record profits. We want to put more money back in the pockets of Canadians through the GST credit, giving them 500 more to renters, and money also for dental care for children who in families with low income. We have support from all parties, and we also want to strengthen the Competition Act so we can better protect consumers. We're going to be here for Canadians. The Honourable Member for New Westminster Burnaby. Mr. Speaker, thanks to the NDP that these measures are in place to actually help Canadians. But there's just pretty words from the Prime Minister when it comes to helping Canadians through this greedflation crisis. The CEOs of big grocery stores are bragging about their massive profits on the backs of families. The Emperor CEO bragged, we improved our, trof our strong margins and he's $8 billion richer. Galen West of Loblaws is proud of achieving strong top-line growth. He's got $5 million dollars more. These CEOs line their pockets while families struggle to feed their kids. When will the Liberals act to stop this profiteering and stop this corporate greed? The honor, right honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, it is unacceptable that corporate CEOs and grocery store CEOs are earning record profits while Canadians are paying more for groceries. That's why we're focused on putting more money back in Canadians' pockets through the GST credit, the $500 for renters, and more money for dental care from kids for low-income families. Uh, we uh, thank the parties in this House that are supporting us on this and call on the Conservatives to support us in delivering dental care uh, for kids from low-income families. We can't understand why the Conservatives continue to stand against that. These are measures that will help low-income families at a very difficult time. Why can't this whole House come together and support dental care for kids? The Honourable Member for Bellechasse, Les Etchemin Levy. Mr. Speaker, the Liberal government decided to protect Hockey Canada the other day rather than women who are victims of sexual abuse. The government has known since 2018 that there was a problem at Hockey Canada and they have blindly turned an eye to it. These women who are victims are, have been abandoned by Hockey Canada and we want to know why this government has closed its eyes on these many cases of sexual assault, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Sport. Mr. Speaker, the government is taking all the necessary action to hold the executives of Hockey Canada to account. We're looking back to 2016 to get all the necessary information to see how public funds were used to solve cases of sexual assault. We also made sure that Hockey Canada has to look at ethics in sport and allow the commissioner to do an investigation. We will not give up. Hockey Canada will be accountable for these cases. Honourable member for Peterborough, Kawartha. Mr. Speaker, this Liberal government has known for four years about the heinous allegations of sexual assault against eight players from Team Canada. Hockey Canada received $14 million from 2020 to 2021 from this Liberal government. Hockey Canada has paid millions to pay off sexual assault claimants. My question is for the Prime Minister, who claims to be a feminist. How is covering up sexual assault helping women? The Honourable Minister for Sports. Mr. President, after hearing today's story about how the Conservatives are mobilizing organizations that promotes violence against, against women, it's a little bit shameful, the questions that they're asking shameful. today. Prince Albert. 
Peter has condemned these actions and actually has asked the Prime Minister to hold himself to account for his actions. So I expect that. But you know, Mr. Speaker, in my writing, they've actually had a nice fall. Harvest is done. They're looking going through their bills. They're saying, oh my God, everything's more expensive due to this Liberal carbon tax. This has meant they have less money to feed their families, to take care of their livestock, to actually pay their heat. Mr. Speaker, will the Prime Minister cancel his plan to triple, triple, triple the carbon tax? Can't he understand Canadians can't afford it? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I know the member opposite works hard with his constituents, and I'm glad he's congratulating them for their harvest. I'd like to congratulate them too. Canada's farmers work hard, and the people of rural Saskatchewan work hard. And we know that times are hard, and that's why I am delighted that today this House will vote to support the GST tax credit. That is going to get nearly $500 to the hard-working Saskatchewan families the member opposite represents. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Forest Lawn. Mr. Speaker, today our leader stood up and condemned everything that the Liberals were calling him out for today. And in contrast, in contrast, not a single Liberal has called out their leader for the racist blackface that he wore. I'm, I'm just going... <laughs> Order. If I could have everyone calm down. If you don't mind, the Honourable Member for Calgary Forest Lawn. From the top, I just want to make sure everybody hears the question so that when the, when the Minister or the Prime Minister answer, then everybody can hear that as well. The Honourable Member for Calgary Forest Lawn. Mr. Speaker, rising interest rates are crushing over 70% of small businesses, according to a report by the CFIB. Small businesses in my riding are being squeezed by rising taxes, record high inflation, labour crisis and punishing interest rates. When will this government wake up and get off the necks of our small businesses and job creators? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Speaker, I thank the member opposite for this important question about the small business entrepreneurs that are at the heart of the Canadian economy. What we've been doing for the past three years is supporting small business entrepreneurs through the pandemic with targeted supports for wage subsidies and access to finance to support them and their employees. What we're doing since the pandemic is we are targeting entrepreneurs that will promote inclusive recovery. That means women entrepreneurs. That means black entrepreneurs. That means indigenous entrepreneurs. What we're doing is understanding small businesses will carry us through and out of this pandemic, and that is where our priority lies. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Forest Lawn. Any type of help is being vaporized by the inflation that they created. This Thanksgiving, the Liberals are serving up Canadians with high inflation, leaving families to turn to food banks and homeless shelters at an alarming rate. Next Thanksgiving, the Liberals will serve Canadians a turducken of tax by triple, triple, tripling the carbon tax on groceries, home heating, and filling up your tank. Will this government have some mercy? Stop serving suffering to Canadians and cancel their plans to triple, triple, triple the carbon tax? Yeah. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, it's a few days before Thanksgiving, and I absolutely agree now is a time for all of us to have a lot of compassion. And that's why I am glad that we have overcome partisan division, and today, together, we're going to vote for the GST tax rebate. That's going to get up to five, nearly $500 to Canadian families who need it. Now I want to encourage all of us to take another step. Let's support Canadian kids under 12 whose parents can't afford to take them to the dentist. How is that okay? Let's vote for this measure too and get it through in record time. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Forest Lawn. Next Thanksgiving, Mr. Speaker, Canadians, after the tripling of the carbon tax, will be paying around $2,300 out of their own pocket. That's just next year. 
And students are some of the hardest hit by this Liberal government's inflationary economic policy and failed carbon tax. While missing every single emissions reduction target, they're punishing Canadians for the crime of heating their homes or just driving to work. The Liberals are driving students to food banks and sleeping in homeless shelters at alarming rates. Will the Liberals get off the backs and out of the back pockets of students and Canadians and cancel their plan to triple, triple, triple the carbon tax? Yeah. The Honourable Minister for Employment. Mr. Speaker, young Canadians and students are the future of Canada. With Budget 2022, we are investing $26 million over four years to increase the maximum amount of forgivable Canada student loans by 50% for healthcare workers in rural and remote communities. We've had students back all along the way, and we, made committed, we remain committed to permanently eliminating the federal interest on Canada student loans and Canada apprentice loans. We will help young Canadians transition into the workforce. The Honourable Member for Lac Saint Jean. Mr. Speaker, the federal government re refuses to discuss immigration powers with Quebec. Well, let's look at what happened when the federal government is in charge. It's responsible refugees, and 64 percent of applications in Canada go through Roxham Road. So becoming a refugee in Canada in 2022 means being exploited by traffickers at the border and then being arrested by the RCMP. This morning, the federal government was dragged before the Supreme Court by refugee advocates for its inaction at Roxham Road. How can it have any lessons to give when this is how it for the people it's responsible for. The Honourable Minister of Edu Immigration, Mr. Speaker, our system for asylum seekers is robust, but there's no magic solution. Roxham Road and suspending the safe third country agreement is not the way to go. We have to, we have to work with states to find a lasting solution. The Honourable Member for Lac saint jean Mr. Speaker, let's continue to look at what's ha what happens when the federal government's in charge of immigration. They're the one in charge of temporary foreign workers. It's so always the same thing. Companies pay for workers who never arrive because their files, files are held up in Ottawa. Even today, the Journal de Montréal quotes companies like NationX, which has been waiting for its workers since last November. They quote discouraged companies who say the investment is not worth it because it takes between six months and a year and a half. Why does the federal government refuse to transfer the temporary foreign worker program to Quebec if it's unable to handle it itself? The Honourable Minister... Here is what you have when the federal government and the provincial government work together. You have men and women who come to Quebec society, who are successful, who work, who learn French. They have children They go to, who go to school. They make friends. They play hockey. They pr contribute to society, Mr. Speaker. It's positive. We have to stop talking about immigration like it's shameful. These are men and women and children, human beings, who come to contribute to Quebec and to Canada, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Lac Saint-Jean. Mr. Speaker, we have to change tone on the other side of the House because we are saying the same thing as them, but when it takes three years to get a work permit, it doesn't help. So let's continue to look at what's happened in, in immigration. Do you know how long it takes to process the file of a skilled Francophone worker in Quebec who wants to become a permanent resident? Two years. But the workers who are much luckier than the Francophone students from Africa who want to come to Quebec, they're outright rejected, 88 percent, twice as much as the norm. That's embarrassing in terms of Im immigration. Either the federal government is incompetent or it's acting in bad faith. In either case, Quebec should be handling immigration. When are they going to do it? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, like the member across the way knows, Quebec has exclusive powers to decide who will immigrate there. And we will work in close collaboration with them to support the target to receive the necessary immigrants so that we can help companies and enforce the vitality as well. We will always work with Quebec today and tomorrow. The Honourable Member for Montmagny, Lisley Camouraska rivière du Loup. Mr. Speaker, $1,200. That's how much more the average Canadian family will have to spend on food this year. And for some people, it's too much. 
parents are going without meals to feed their children, and food bank use is skyrocketing across the country. The Liberal government is about to triple the carbon tax and increase the tax on EI. And as a result, the cost of food, products and services will triple, triple, triple at the expense of consumers. Will this government cancel its tax increases, yes or no? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to begin by thanking the member across the way for his support for our plan for inflation relief measures. It's the right decision. It will help families and people across our country. Now, I would sincerely like to sh ask all members of this House to also support our plan to help children, young children, in terms of dental care. We have to do it, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Calgary Confederation. Mr. Speaker, every day I get another letter from my constituents in Calgary telling me about the challenges that they are having making ends meet. Inflation rises, taxes rise, but their paychecks do not. 8% inflation has the effect of cutting a full month of purchasing power from the annual family budget. Many Canadians are worried about how they will eat and stay warm this winter. Will this Liberal government cancel their plans to triple, triple, tripling taxes on gas, groceries, and home heating. Yeah. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, let me start with a small point. Inflation, the latest number was actually 7%. That is still too high, and that is still causing real challenges for Canadian families. That's why I am really sincerely pleased that the Conservatives swallowed their pride and are supporting our GST tax credit that is going to get nearly $500 to Canadian families. I would like to urge them now to take the next step, it's hard, swallow their pride again, and to support dental care for children who need it under 12. Mm -hmm. The Honourable Member for Kenora. Mr. Speaker, everything is getting more expensive as this government drives up inflation with its tax and spend policies. Now they are planning to triple taxes on gas, triple taxes on groceries, and triple taxes on home heating. Mr. Speaker, this is all while Canadians are struggling to get by and just barely able to afford, afford the basic necessities. Mr. Speaker, will the Finance Minister today finally announce a plan to cancel her tax hikes that will triple, triple, triple the cost? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Speaker, the Conservatives had said that today they would put forward a private member's bill promoting crypto. But earlier this week, and for the third time in a row, they pulled the bill. Now, I hope that that means the Conservatives are collectively embarrassed by their leader's reckless advice to Canadians to invest in crypto. I really hope that's the case, and I hope that now they will have the good grace to publicly recant and to apologize to Canadians for that reckless, dangerous advice. The Honourable Member for Churchill, Kuwetnuk Askey. Mr. Speaker, we have a government of fakers. The Liberals fake standing with working people, and they may even believe it, which is shocking given the record of corporate giveaways and refusal to make the wealthy pay their fair share to the tune of $30 billion in 2021 oh, alone. Man. The reality is that billionaires have it easier under this prime minister. I'm going to interrupt the honorable member for a moment. And I want to remind everyone, just because someone is here virtually and it's nice and loud over the microphone, uh, over the speakers, doesn't mean we can all talk. So I want to remind everybody to keep it down. And for those watching remotely, please don't cut in. It's really not polite. The Honourable Member for Churchill-Kuwatnudaski, from the top, please. 
Mr. Speaker, we have a government of fakers, the Liberals fake standing up for working people. They may even believe it, which is shocking given the record of corporate giveaways and refusal to make the wealthy pay their fair share to the tune of $30 billion in 2021 alone. The reality is the billionaires have it easier under this Prime Minister than they did under Stephen Harper. It's time for fair taxation. It's time to make the rich pay. So which will it be, more faking or will the Liberals make the ultra-rich pay their fair share to deliver the support Canadians need now. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government absolutely is committed to ensuring that everyone in Canada pays their fair share. And we have shown it with concrete measures. Let me remind all members in this House that we are permanently raising the corporate income tax by 1.5 per cent on the largest, most profitable banks and insurance companies. We are introducing a Canada recovery dividend of 15 per cent on banks and insurance companies to do the right thing and help pay for the cost of COVID. And of course, our luxury tax on super expensive cars, yachts, and planes is already in force. The Honourable Member for South Okanagan, West Kootenay. Mr. Speaker, families dealing with the rising cost of living are worried about what they can afford. Canadian financial institutions already charge some of the highest credit card fees in the world while making record profits. Now Canadian consumers will have to pay those charges directly, simply by using their credit cards. New Democrats have urged both Conservative and Liberal governments to cap credit card fees at 1 per cent. But governments keep protecting corporate profits. Will, will the Liberals finally defend Canadians by capping credit card merchant fees? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I spoke just a moment ago about our commitment to ensure that everyone in Canada pays their fair share, and I listed some of the very concrete tax measures which are coming into force, some of which have come into force already. We're going to keep going. When it comes to credit card fees, I am very much in agreement with the member opposite. We need to support consumers. We need to support small businesses. We're committed to doing that, and we will. The Honourable Member for Malpec. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, like many other Atlantic Canadian communities, Malpec was hit extremely hard in the province of Prince Edward Island. Jobs, livelihoods, and infrastructures were, was destroyed. Can the Minister of Rural Economic Development tell me and the rest of Atlantic Canada, how this government is going to help rebuild. The Honourable Minister for Rural and Economic Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank my colleague from Prince Edward Island. On the ground at home last week, I saw what we know about Eastern Canadians. Ma'am, we come together during difficult times, and I want everyone to know that the federal government has come together under these difficult times to help everyone get through this. On top of the disaster financial assistance agreements, which are administered through the province, which covers up to 90 per cent of the cost of this terrible storm damage, we announced this week the Fiona, Hurricane Fiona Recovery Fund. That's an additional $300 million to help people and businesses whose situations may fall through the cracks under the DFFA. Mr. Speaker, the federal government will be there with every person, every community, every business as we build back stronger and get back on our feet in Atlantic Canada. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Riverbend. Mr. Speaker, the price of everything has gone up and now almost half of Canadians are $200 away from insolvency. Jennifer and Kristen are two moms in my riding that recently reached out to me to stress they can't afford to pay $1 more. So will this Prime Minister cancel his plans to triple, triple, triple the taxes on gas, groceries and home heating? The Honourable Minister for Families. Mr. Speaker, when we compare our record to the Conservatives, there's a clear difference in which side of the House has been there on behalf of Canadians. Mr. Speaker, whether it's the Canada Child Benefit, whether it's the middle income tax cut, whether it's child care that in Alberta is now reduced by 50 per cent, or whether it's dental that we are trying to get through this House, but for some reason the Conservatives don't want children to have access to dental care. Mr. Speaker, we continue to stand for families. We'll continue to do that, and we hope the Conservatives get on side. Thank you, Mr. The Honourable Member for Brandon Suris. Healy Westman residents tell me it's getting tougher to make ends meet. Under this Liberal government, Canada is the only G7 country to raise taxes on energy. 
This drives up the cost of everything, particularly those in rural Canada. It's not just, Mr. Speaker, it's inflation. Yeah. So will the Prime Minister leave these dollars in the pockets of cash-strapped seniors and families by cancelling the plan to triple, triple, triple taxes on gasoline, groceries and home heating fuel? Yeah. Yeah. The Honourable Minister for Families. Mr. Speaker, our record on supporting children, families and seniors is an important one. You know what the first thing we did, Mr. Speaker, was is we lowered income taxes for middle-income Canadians. You know what else we did? We reversed the increase in pensions for uh, seniors from the Conservatives that wanted to raise the age of eligibility to 67. We increased the GIS, Mr. Speaker. We increased the OIS and we created a generous Canada Child Benefit. Mr. Speaker, we have been there every single day for Canadian families, Canadian seniors, and we're going to continue to do that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Barry Innisfil. The inflation and affordability crisis facing Canadians right now is a direct result of this Prime Minister's failed economic policies. And when the Prime Minister of a G7 country admits he doesn't even think about monetary policy, it's Canadian families and businesses that pay the price, and they are. They're paying the price with higher payroll taxes, higher costs of the necessity necessities of life, like food, shelter, heating and clothing, and it's getting worse. Families need a break, Mr. Speaker. Will the Prime Minister stop his planned tax hikes on Canadian paychecks and his plan to triple, triple and triple the carbon tax? Yeah. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, monetary policy is, of course, the province of the Bank of Canada, mm -hmm. whose independence we on this side of the House ah. respect. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we know, we know that times are tough for Canadian families. That's why I'm actually really glad today that we in this House have overcome petty partisan squabbles and are coming together to support the GST tax credit. It is going to get nearly $500 to the Canadian families who need it the most. It's time to do the same thing on dental care for kids and on rental support. The Honourable Member for Lévis-Lobinière. Mr. Speaker, with the Liberals' inflationary taxes, Canadians have become so impoverished with under $200 a month to pay the bills. And this Liberal government is ignoring the cost of living. Canadians can't tighten their belts any further. Mr. Speaker, can the Prime Minister tell us if he will eliminate the triple, triple, triple tax on gas, food, and heating. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Monsieur le Mr. Speaker, we understand full well that affordability and the cost of living are important and difficult issues for many Canadian families, and that's why I'm so delighted today that this place is going to vote all together for our idea, our plan, to provide inflation relief. That's the right thing to do. It's a good thing. Now we need to come together once again around dental care for children. The Honourable Member for Avignon, La Métis, Matan, Matapédia. Mr. Speaker, from January to August of this year, 23,196 refugee claimants were intercepted by the RCMP at Roxham Road. Men, women and children who are often fleeing poverty. 23,196 people greeted on arrival to Canada by the police, who may then detain them or have them make a refugee claim. Mr. Speaker, my question is simple. Is this really how Canada should be greeting refugees? The Honourable Minister of Immigration. Mr. Speaker, closing Roxham Road is not a solution because it won't solve the general problem. As the member opposite knows, Canada shares the longest demilitarized border in the world. People crossing at Roxham Road have to provide ID. Uh, and what we need to do is update the agreement, the safe third country deal, and that's what we're doing. The Honourable Member for Avignon. 
Mr. Speaker, 23,196 refugee claimants intercepted by the RCMP this year at Roxham Road alone. Meanwhile, 499 refugee claimants crossed at recognized land border crossings. So CBSA officers, whose job it is, are handling just 2% of the caseload, while the RCMP at Roxham Road are dealing with the other 98%. Once again, my question is simple. Wouldn't it be better if customs officers dealt with customs and police officers dealt with, I don't know, illegal guns, for example? <laughs> The Honourable Minister of Immigration. Monsieur Président, c'est important. Les solutions. The solutions the Bloc are proposing will just move the problem somewhere else. It's important to manage our caseload at the borders. And as the members know full well, there's a bilateral agreement with the U.S. We need to work with our American counterparts and continue to support very vulnerable people. Great. Mr. Speaker, prices are out of control in Canada. Businesses are raising prices to keep up with costs. Individuals are cutting back on groceries. Families are renewing their mortgages to find out that their payments are double. Seniors are panicked about being able to afford their heating fuel. Canadians know rebate checks don't cover these costs. We need a government committed to lowering costs. Will the Liberal government cancel its plan to triple, triple, triple tax on gas, groceries and home heating? Yeah. Yeah. The Honourable Minister for Senior. the challenges that seniors are facing and our government has been there for them and to now help seniors who are struggling we're doubling the GST credit that means seniors will receive an extra $230 in their pockets nearly 2 million low-income renters who are struggling with their rent will receive $500 Mr. Speaker we also increase the old age security for seniors age 75 by 10 percent Mr. Speaker on this side of the house we're going to continue to create an economy that works for everyone including seniors thank you the honorable member for Wellington Halton Hills Mr. Speaker, the government's priorities are descending into farce. They won't allow U.S. officers into Canada to reopen Nexus offices, even though we have an agreement and the United States is an ally. Meanwhile, Iranian officers freely come to this country to intimidate Canadians because they won't list the IRGC. And now we find out that police officers from the People's Republic of China are operating out of three offices illegally opened in Canada, intimidating Canadians. So what is the government doing about these illegal police stations in Toronto? The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, I want to be unequivocally clear that we continue to condemn in the most strong terms uh, the brutal killing of Masa Amini in Iran, in Iran. We will continue to ensure that we are taking every appropriate action to hold those responsible for their transgressions. We stand with the women. We stand with everyone who is advocating for human rights, Mr. Speaker. And if they, if speaking about women's rights, it would be a fine moment for Conservatives to stand up and apologize for the way in which they exploited technology to proliferate hate among anti-women misogynistic groups. Today is the day to do that, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute-Saint-Charles. Mr. Speaker, the National Post is reporting that the Chinese Communist regime has opened at least three police stations on Canadian soil to keep tabs on Chinese Canadians. China maintains the stations are just there to help expats with administrative tasks like renewing their driver's licenses. But the Chinese Communist regime is not in the habit of telling the truth. This isn't the first time we or the Prime Minister have heard about Chinese Communists harassing Canadians. Is the National Post story accurate? And without the rhetoric, can the Prime Minister tell us what he's going to do about it? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety clear track record of providing all of the tools that are necessary to our national security apparatus to combat the kind of foreign interference and threats to, threats to national security that my uh, colleague across the aisle talks about. It was the last Conservative government that cut nearly a billion dollars out of that national security apparatus. We restored those cuts because we know it's important and paramount to protect Canadians from all threats, and we will continue to do that. No, no, I the Honourable Member for Barassa. Mr. Speaker, 
Today we are more aware of the realities facing black communities in Canada. And that's why the Minister of Housing, Diversity and Inclusion issued a call this week for proposals from organizations to manage the $200 million black-led philanthropic endowment fund announced by our government. Can the minister tell the House how this fund will support black communities? Thank you. The Right Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member for his question. We understand that black-led, black-focused and black-serving organizations are essential to fighting racism and inequality. That's why our government created the Black-Led Philanthropic Endowment Fund. This fund will be managed by black-led charities and social enterprises that serve the community. We will continue to build on our progress towards a more inclusive and equitable country. Thornhill. The Prime Minister was asked four times yesterday if he believed that the IRGC is a terrorist organization. They shot down a plane killing 55 Canadians. They have intimidated Iranian families right here on Canadian soil. They have killed thousands of their own people. They have raped and murdered women and girls, and they have terrorized the world. If the Prime Minister can't bring himself to call the IRGC terrorists, who does he think are the terrorists? Yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I think every member in this House stands to condemn the heinous actions of the, Ira the, the Iranian regime. We stand in solidarity with women, uh, particularly um, uh, Amina Masi and uh, all of the, the people who have been subjected to the tremendous terror of this regime. That is why, indeed, we have sponsored, uh, we, have, we have said that Iran is a state sponsor of terror, and we will continue to take every action necessary to ensure that uh, Iran's crimes go punished. Honourable Member for Thornhill. Mr. Speaker, we don't have the strongest sanctions in the world. They, we should. They killed 55 Canadians. The Prime Minister stood in this House in 2018 and voted to ban the IRGC from Canada. And yesterday, he couldn't even bring himself to call them terrorists. To all of the families of the victims of Flight 752, to all of the women protesting in the streets and the Iranian-Canadian community who are terrorized by the IRGC despots who are in Canada organizing, planning, and raising money, when will the government show some courage and call a terrorist a terrorist? Yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On this side of the House, we want real action that will actually target where danger lies. We do not have time for jargon and rhetoric. We do not have time to try to make a political spectacle out of this. Real people are hurting. Real Canadians have been hurt. And we will continue to take every action possible to make sure that we target very specifically those who commit heinous crimes. That's what we will do on this side of the House. The Honourable Member for Miramichi Grand Lake. Mr. Speaker, look at what's going on here today. We have a government that can't say the IRGC are terrorists. We know from C5 that the Liberals are weak on crime. Now we know they're weak on terrorism. The IRGC fired a missile at a civilian airliner, murdering 176 people, 55 Canadians, 30 permanent residents. This is personal for this country. A simple question for the government. If the IRGC are not terrorists, then who is? Here, here. The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, uh, we say with a very clear voice on this side of the House that Iran is a state that supports terror. We will continue to call out those who are responsible for all the transgressions of human rights. We will continue to stand with the families who are advocating for women's rights, Mr. Speaker, and they want to talk about being weak on law and order. When are they going to finally wake up, Conservatives, and do what is right when it comes to combating gun violence in our communities? Their only plan is to make assault-style rifles again. That's wrong. On this side of the House, we'll continue to do what's necessary to protect health and safety of Canadians and to protect human rights around the world. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Brampton South. Diabetes is a serious chronic disease and one of the most common affecting millions of Canadians. It poses extensive challenges for those living with it, including their families and communities. 
Yesterday, the framework for diabetes in Canada was tabled, marking a pivotal moment in our ongoing efforts to support Canadians impacted by this disease. Can the Minister of Health tell this House about how this will contribute to our efforts to better support and collaborate with those impacted by diabetes in Canada? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to start first by thanking the member for Brampton South for her outstanding work, including the work she did to proceed yesterday with the announcement of the first day of the framework for diabetes. That framework is going to support the lives of millions of Canadians living with diabetes, their caregivers, their families, their friends, and their health care professionals with a better access to diagnostic services, treatment and prevention services. Mr. Speaker, we're going to support the work of all those who help the people living with diabetes and all those that care for them. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Nunavut. Nunavut deserve a government that takes Indigenous mental health seriously. It is not enough for the government to only announce $11 million for the National Inuit Suicide Prevention Strategy, despite committing to $228 million for Indigenous mental health. Indigenous people rightfully expect more from this government, who continues to be all talk with no action. Will this government finally commit to culturally appropriate Indigenous mental health funding that they promised? The Honourable Minister. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member opposite for her constant advocacy for equity and for Indigenous-led and designed mental wellness strategies. And in fact, that's a tip what we were announcing today with President Obed of ITK, an additional top-up of $11 million for the work that ITK is doing with partners across, uh, across the territories. And I will say, Mr. Speaker, promises being shown by these Indigenous-led approaches. It was an honour to be with uh, President Obed today to announce that the federal government will top up the funding that ITK has by $11 million. The Honourable Member for Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Earlier this year, we learned that the cost for the Trans Mountain Expansion Project had ballooned to $21.4 billion, more than double the estimated cost when this government bought the pipeline in 2018. At the time, the Deputy PM assured us that the government will spend no additional public money on the project. Yet a new report out today shows that Canadians are being misled. Trans Mountain is not commercially viable, and $17 billion in TMX debt owed to, to Canadians won't be repaid. When will the governing party truly stop wasting Canadians' uh, money on this climate-killing project? <laughs> The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as Canadians, we all know how important it is to get our resources to market and to get fair value for them. Putin's illegal war in Ukraine and OPEC's actions this week have further underscored that essential truth. The government does not intend to be a long-term owner of the project. A divestment process will be initiated once the project is more advanced, de-risked, and essentially when consultations with Indigenous partners have been concluded. I'm afraid that's all the time we have. C'est tout le temps que nous avons. We have a point of order. The Honourable Member for Barry Innisfil. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, in Ontario, the government funds a program that provides free preventative routine uh, maintenance and emergency dental services for children and youth 17 years and old and under. It's called the Healthy Smiles Program, Mr. Speaker, and these are for low-income households. Uh, with the House's permission, I'm seeking unanimous consent to table the documents in both official languages. All those opposed to the Honourable Member moving the motion will please say nay. I'm afraid we don't have unanimous consent. It being 3.12, pursuant to order made on Monday, October 3rd, 2022, the House will now proceed to the taking of the deferred...